many things in so many places. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paulette. I love being here. Sorry for the late hour, but I think it's just extraordinary the amount of energy that goes into organizing band books. Paulette and her team start early in the summer, and trust me, I'm getting emails all the way through until right now, and I'm sure I'll get that after too. So uh, I really appreciate the amount of energy that they put into making this happen every year. That is super duper whooper important. And that means it's super important to think about these issues. So, can we? Yeah. Right. So that's my title, Reading and Writing, In Prison from the Inside Out and the Outside In, and I kept having to remind myself what my title was. Um, so up here are just some resources. You can copy them down or talk to me afterwards about resources. My card is on the table over there, along with some newsletters, the existence of which I'll explain during the course of our talk. Uh, but this is just a list of resources, my email about the Inside Out program, or anything else you want to talk to me about. Um, Arjun will be bringing up prisonpolicy.org and sentencingproject.org websites during the talk. And then these are resources that will bring you to some writings by incarcerated individuals that you can explore and work with on your own time. <clears throat> when your five-year-old says, draw me a lion, don't tell him not to climb in your lap without permission. Don't tell him you don't have the time, or you don't know how to draw, or that this is the wrong color crayon, or to say, please, sit down with that purple crayon and draw the best damn line you can. Remember that this is a child who draws the sky as a blue band across the top of the page, and the earth as a green strip across the bottom. It doesn't occur to him to explain all that white in between. He could care less that it looks like a lion by the time it's finished. It doesn't matter to him that he asked the right way. It matters that you did it. And that for five whole minutes, you were his. This is a haiku. Freedom, family gone, silver cuffs, cold dark, white snow, I sit in despair. Those two clips were written by people with whom I work at the Toledo Correctional Institution and published in a magazine that the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program puts together at least two or three times a year. Uh, we have a new one on the way uh, under production now. And I wanted to offer that up because it just indicates the level of talent and um, thoughtfulness and incredible uh, seriousness with which many, many, many people inside prisons take writing and take their writing skills and take their writing practices. My talk is about the challenges, but also about the importance of reading and if and when possible, directly hearing and listening carefully to the narratives and voices of people who are incarcerated. There are many layers of stigma, bureaucracy, law, and literally cement walls and metal gates between those of us who are not incarcerated and those of us who are. Effort must be put in, effort, effort, effort must be put in to developing lines of communication, both spoken and in writing, if we are going to make mass incarceration a bad memory rather than the current disaster that it is. I don't teach in prisons because I want to fix the people who are in prison. I teach in prisons because I want to abolish prisons. Now that sounds sort of pie in the sky and endlessly like on the horizon, but that's why I do it. That's my aspiration, because I want to bring the people's voices who are incarcerated to the world and engage them in a discussion that will eventually, I think, lead to the end of mass incarceration. I coordinate a collaboration between the University of Toledo and the Toledo Correctional Institution called the UT Inside Out Prison Exchange Program. We bring students from UT to the Toledo Correctional Institution to take an accredited course, UT course, with incarcerated students in an integrated and interactive classroom environment. That's the formal definition, right? Very formal. The program is modeled on a national initiative that trains faculty to engage in this kind of interactive class across the walls. In other words, I didn't invent this. I wish I did, but I didn't. Um, I'm, I've been trained at a very intensive 24-7 week-long workshop along with over 800 other faculty from across the six different countries, uh, most of them in the US, but also Canada, Australia, Germany, Mexico. 
uh, to do this kind of work. So we're part of a much larger initiative. I always explain to students that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. And so therefore, we have to treat it respectfully and be very careful about the terms in which we engage. Um, this semester, uh, Dr. Matt Foss from the theater program is teaching a course on performative storytelling. Uh, in the spring, I'll offer a course that is about mass incarceration, how it happened, why it is being perpetuated, what we should do about it, if anything. And so, like I said, my email's there. Please connect with me if you'd like more information or if you want to enroll in that class. But I didn't come here just to promote the inside out class, although I always do that everywhere I go. Um, my husband started here. My husband actually teaches an inside out class. That's how well I promoted it at home. He has a <laughs> class at Albion College up in Michigan. So, you know, I must be persuasive on some level because he never does anything else that I think is a good idea. But I didn't come just to do that. I'm always doing that. I came here to talk about reading, listening to, and engaging with the words, ideas, and thoughts of those who are incarcerated. The Inside Out program is one way we at the, at the university are engaging in that process. But let's have a look at mass incarceration, which many of you may be more or less familiar with some of the numbers. Because we can learn about the problem through the numbers, and we can kind of try to address it with our fellow citizens by persuading them by the numbers. There are 1,079 public prisons and 82 privately run prisons, not detention centers, not jails, not halfway houses, prisons in the United States. There are 32 prisons, state prisons, in the state of Ohio alone. There are 50,000 people incarcerated in the state of Ohio alone. And we're kind of average across the states in terms of the proportion of people we incarcerate. No other nation on earth incarcerates the proportion of their citizenry that the US does. We have 4% of the world's 4.2% now of the world's population. Apparently it's sinking, it was 5% last time I checked. And 20% of the world's incarcerated population. So we are the mass incarcerator of the world. We incarcerate over a million, uh, 400 and, what is that number? 1,042,000 individuals in state prisons. And if we include jails and federal prisons, the number moves to over 2 million. On average, we incarcerate 641 out of 100,000 of our citizens at any given point. That's average. If you look from state to state, Washington state is at about like 130 per 100,000, whereas Louisiana is more like 645 per 100,000. So nationally, it's like you can look at the aggregate numbers, but you know a lot of people are looking at Germany or Norway or other places to learn how to do incarceration better or figure it out. But we can look at our own state models. You know, we can look at Washington State, and while it's a very different culture in Washington State from Louisiana, there are ways in which we can talk to each other about this uh, without going to Germany or Norway. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, about 600,000 individuals enter prison every year, and 10.6 million people enter jails in any given year. That's a lot of churn, is the technical term for it. It's an ugly term, but it's kind of what it feels like when you're involved. The average cost of confining an individual in a state prison changes from state to state. In the state of New York, on average, it costs over $69,000 a year to incarcerate an individual in state prisons. In Ohio, it's about $30,000 a year. Cost of living on less stuff. Or $80.91 a day in Ohio. I don't think that the numbers game has been a particularly effective strategy for change. You can debate that. Um, people started paying attention to this issue you know, in the last decade or so. A lot of people know these numbers. Mass incarceration became a very common phrase in the elections of 2012, 2016. Um, not so much in 2020, because we had other things to contend with. Um, but yeah, it's, so, so before 2010, I never heard the phrase mass incarceration outside my own classroom or my scholarly community. right? But now it's just pretty common. People kind of know. And they know what the numbers are. But when you look at criminal justice, it's a very local and state issue. And that's where the fight has to be fought. And there are people doing extraordinary work, public prosecutors, jail reformers, people really on the ground doing amazing work. But the numbers haven't ticked down significantly. We are still the primary incarcerator in the world. So that, that said, we could also study it from the perspective of human rights. As a mass citizenry, many groups and individuals have done this for decades, as I said. We've only begun to acknowledge the extent of the problem we have created. In comparison to other wealthy or more or less democratic countries, and even poor and less democratic countries, we have created what amounts to a penal archipelago. 
If you go into the air in California and fly a small plane over the state of California, you can see from one prison to the next. That's how many there are. It's extraordinary. The Golden Gulag is an amazing book by Ruthie Gilmore that focuses on the state of California and the political economy of its prison system, and it's just fabulous. Because it talks about the program, and it also talks in very gritty and personal and on-the-ground ways with people who are uh, struggling within it and to end it. So we, in prison, people who are convicted for crimes for extraordinary lengths of time, and one of the um, websites up here, the, the Sentencing Project, has been working since I think they were founded in 1990 on trying to reduce the time that we think is appropriate for people to be inside prisons after doing whatever they did to deserve to be there in the first place. Um, in any event, we incarcerate people for much longer than any rational assessment of how long it might take a person to become so-called reformed, whatever that means. This has resulted in a level of overcrowding that results in allowing thousands of individuals only the space of a single bug bed to live in. And to talk about how extreme that's become in the um, uh, uh, Brown versus, uh, I'm having a brain, you know what, I'm sorry. Um, the California case that uh, told the California in 2010 Supreme Court case, Brown, Brown versus Plata, thank you, Brain, um, that, uh, that the, the images and the, 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 the words to describe what conditions were like in, are like in California prisons were not enough for Supreme Court justices. They added pictures on, images on, to the end of their opinion, saying that California had to reduce its population, not just build more prisons or do, you know, it couldn't do that. Um, <laughs> there's a point where you just simply can't build more prisons. Um, and, uh, but they actually added pictures to show, for example, that we are allowing thousands of individuals only the space of a single bunk bed to live in. The pictures are extraordinary. You can just Google Brown v. Plata and look at the end of the decision and you'll see the pictures. Further, we place tens of thousands of individuals in brutal conditions of solitary confinement because of allegations they are members of gangs or because prison staff identify untreated mental illness as acting out. Twelve states still allow women to be shackled while in labor and giving birth, and that we have to pass laws to prohibit that practice in our system is kind of extraordinary on the face of it. Individuals are being beaten to death in prisons and jails with impunity. Just look at the Rikers Island series in the New York Times. Because some prison unions and administrators protect the worst of the worst of correctional officers. And you'll often hear, if you work in prisons long enough, or you can go to a prison for a day and you'll hear this, that places like Toledo incarcerate the worst of the worst because it's a maximum security prison and these people are the worst of the worst. The uh, pieces that I offered you at the very beginning were written by people who are incarcerated at Toledo Correctional Institution. And yes, they may change from the time they're writing that to how they are back in the cell blocks, et cetera, but there are human beings and there with extraordinary talent and intellect. Um, all right, so um, given these conditions, it might seem odd to sort of think about reading and writing and free speech and questions of censorship in this context. Um, so I want to address that a little bit because I'm arguing here that if we're to change our way of punishment, we also must know what people who are incarcerated have to say about why they're there and about the conditions in which they are held. And I mean that from the most so-called normal prisons. Because the prison I work in is a normal prison. People are not brutalized on a regular basis. There's a lot of violence there. It's, but it's, it's, it's really considered a normal prison. It's only built back in 2000. And so it's not all decayed and horrible yet. Um, but, you know, it's considered a normal so-called prison. Um, but part of the reason I teach classes in prison is that I wish to make it more likely that those incarcerated will find their voices, develop an analysis of their situation that is not just about their individual failings and choices. I am so sick of hearing that, that you end up in prison because your individual choices and failings. Yeah, people do things wrong. That's absolutely right. But there's so much more to it. There's structural analysis, there's structural racism, there's structural political economic reasons, et cetera. Um, so I want the people who are actually living there to not only receive the message that they are to blame for their own situation, but also to be able to articulate the kind of analysis that we are sitting around articulating in academia. Most people in prison have had little to no access to formal education. 35% of state inmates and 33% of federal inmates and 
2% of jail inmates and 11% of probationers have successfully passed the GED in any given year. That's on average. So 35% of state inmates successfully have, the, you know, will have a GED. The catch is that those with a GED, at least seven in 10, seven in 10 state and federal inmates obtain their GED while incarcerated. They're coming in with nothing, right? So there you have the, the floor from which we start, right? There is no floor. Many incarcerated individuals, I have to say, are autodidacts. They're doing their best to self-educate and some doing incredibly good work with limited resources available. But free speech simply is not very meaningful if one feels one should not or is not able to speak for lack of language, education, formal different perspectives, etc. So apart from learning about the criminal justice system and prisons themselves, we learn more about the individuals themselves when their writing is made available on the outside, rendering those inside less easy to stigmatize and forget, but also getting valuable insight about crime and punishment itself. We need to think a lot more about punishment itself, what we want from it and why, if we're going to change the system. So I think about it in terms of our capacity as citizens altogether, because people incarcerated are still citizens, altogether in the construction of the public sense of what is just, justice. The First Amendment goes some way to prevent that capacity from being limited to the privilege of a few, but it doesn't go very far. With some effort, again, effort, work, we can include even the most deliberately excluded of us in our public debates. The argument I'm making with many, many others is that we must do that. We must think past, especially our fear and loathing of those incarcerated and start thinking yeah. about them as necessary interlocutors in thinking about justice. Is this because I think everybody inside tells the truth? No, any more than I think that people who run prisons and create prison policy and teach classes at the University of Toledo always tell the truth, right? So no, I don't think everybody is like truth tellers about something or that their voices are epistemologically more valuable than anybody else's. They should be a part of the conversation because they have some things to contribute as equals in some respect. So when I think about the First Amendment, I think about how important it is for people in various situations to not only have the right but the capacity to speak publicly and contribute to the public interpretation of those situations rather than being only spoken about or for. So I think about it in terms of people who receive public assistance claiming a voice, and not only when we discuss welfare reform, but about any public policy. I think about it in terms of people who are immigrants making claims that are heard among the other claims about what happens at the border or in the workplace. And I will, as I will discuss further, I argue that we must not only protect, but cultivate the capacity of those who have broken the law to contribute to public discussions about punishment and justice. And anything else we want to talk about, because I really emphasize to all of our students on the inside and outside, we're not just here to talk about prisons. And again, it's not because direct experience necessarily leads to some kind of privileged insight or wisdom. It may be true in some way. I cannot put myself in the place of a person who's been incarcerated for 20 years. But I do think, uh, but I think that that's a limited way of thinking about how we participate in the public space. So I think of the First Amendment uh, right to speech very generally as one among many sites and tools of struggle as we try to create a space of public argument about justice where the most marginal among us are present. And I'll give you a, a good example of how piecemeal this um, this is, be, how piecemeal the efforts are, but how great and important those efforts are. In Michigan, the ACLU has just filed suit to allow books that are written in international languages to be allowed into the Michigan prison system. Uh, because they, they made a big concession recently and allowed dictionaries that translate from Spanish to English or German to English or whatever, or Arabic to English into prisons, but now their struggle is to get books and uh, materials in other languages. And you all can guess why they don't think that the, the languages that the institutional workers and staff there can't read are not a good idea, right? It's hard, not hard to guess what the security claims are. So we're always balancing those security claims against speech claims and freedom to read claims. So go ACLU. The power of speech, of expression. Yeah. <laughs> power of attorney, that's where I, no, I'd be, I don't know where I'd be. Um,
Um, so in general, I'm just I'm just saying what sound may seem obvious, but often in our First Amendment debates, we get very uh, kind of um, just kind of obscured. To sustain our democracy in the face of mass incarceration, we must not only protect the right in itself in some abstract way, but cultivate the capacity to exercise it as effectively as possible, even in and from unexpected places like prison. So the rights to speak and write are not had like possessions, right? They must be exercised like muscles. And if those muscles are constrained by the cement and metal and violence and forced invisibility to which people who are incarcerated are subjected, for the thoughtlessness, lack of real educational opportunities, structural inequality, will for ignorance, or just plain laziness, to which we all, inside and outside, fall prey, our democracy is in trouble. So I just want to turn briefly to the writing and speech of individuals. How much time do I have? Well, what, I what time is it? It's uh, 4.40. All right. I'll start waiting for eyes to close over and I'll stop. <laughs> Students have this great ability to like look at you like this. And then you ask them a question, they go, what was the question? <laughs> Historically, in Anglo-Saxon common law, sentences of incarceration were described as making a person civilly dead. When an individual is stripped of legal recognition or protection, it is a civic death. In the contemporary court in the United States, in non-capital cases, the judge issues essentially a civil death warrant as he or she sentences an individual to prison. As sentenced per persons leave the court, the Department of Corrections takes custody and begins the process of revoking his or her civic sorry, awkward identity. Personal property is taken. There's no right to property in, for the incarcerated. Clothes are stripped off. There's no right to privacy. Or if there's Orifices are examined, again, no right to privacy. Prison issue clothing is put on, a number is assigned, hair is cut, beards are shaved, makeup washed off. There's no right to individual expression or style in prison, though there are some exceptions for religious expression. And the newly processed inmate waits to be assigned to the security level the system identifies as appropriate. This process becomes very mundane to those who work in the prison and perform it multiple times a day. As I said, 600,000 people are coming in prison every day. A lot of people are also leaving. It surely is loading up. It is profound, however, in that it is the beginning of the process of making a person civilly dead, as surely as loading up the needles to implement lethal injection is the start of making a body physically dead. Once an individual is situated inside prison as an inmate, what's it like? Most of this comes from 30 years of experience teaching in prisons in Massachusetts and Michigan and Ohio, and also from the um, very immediate experience of the people that I'm working with now and what they say and how they uh, describe it, so I don't uh, make a claim for my own knowledge of this. Prisons as institutions cultivate banality and boredom. There's no space for privacy or voluntary solitude. Relationships are primarily instrumental. Everyday life is lived among strangers who become familiar, that are rarely known or trusted. The condition of dependence upon correctional officers is enforced, and behavior is assumed corrupt unless proven otherwise. You want to read a foreign language book? We know what that's about, right? The skill many incarcerated individuals cultivate in response to these conditions is that of disappearing into the population. Doing your own time, it's called, is the aspirational norm in prisons. In prison, revealing oneself to others is always a risk. In revealing oneself to others, so crucial to political activity, one risks violence and or soul-crushing humiliation. This enforced hiddenness of the self is another facet of the civil death imposed with a sentence of incarceration. So I would argue we must include the voices, writing, and words of those who have violated the law because there must be a counter to what otherwise the outside world or we think about how and why we punish and, as importantly, who we punish. I argue the counter voice must in part come from within the walls. I don't argue it again because I think that people who are incarcerated will tell the truth or a truth. I argue it because in the cacophony of voices, in the cacophony of representation that constitutes our political world, those who are being punished by us, the citizenry, should have a voice as human beings and as potential sources of knowledge and understanding. 
So while civil death is a long-standing tradition in carceral contexts, it can be changed or at least mitigated. Now the problem is that a lot of prisoners' rights movements in the 70s and 80s just led to more high-tech, cleaner prisons where the abuses and the, the, the conditions of life were a little less awful, right? But it didn't, you know, so prisoners' rights are, I was just talking with one of our students yesterday, he was telling the story of the hunger strikes in uh, 2012 in the state of Ohio and organizing those. And the conditions he described were just extraordinary. He was at the Ohio State Penitentiary in, in Youngstown. And this was also a time when uh, hunger strikers were active in the California prisons, in the California system. One of the longest lived, largest hunger strikes in the history of US incarceration. And so the, the conditions are, uh, yeah. So again, but it can be changed or at least mitigated, but most of the changes have come because of activism from the inside combined with activism and collaborating with activists on the outside. It hasn't come from, I'll just say, the ODRC. The director of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction is appointed by the governor. And so who the director of ODRC is depends very much on the governor, et cetera, et cetera. And you can draw your own conclusions from that. So as one means to counter these dynamics of civil death, of, of, of involuntary solitude, of the cement, and the, the fences to keep us apart, one counter, and if you could go to the website, I forgot to ask you to go to the other ones, but people can write it down. But the www.hamilton, can you go to that website? Oh, yeah. I love, he gave up on me. He's like, she's not going to ask me to do anything. <laughs> I don't want to tell people. Yeah, no, no, so I'm, always done. I'm always done. So go to the Hamilton one. Support of the National Endowment for the Humanities and now the Carnegie Mellon Foundation. I just learned something new about this archive. Doran Larson, an English professor at Hamilton College, launched the American Prison Writing Archive. This archive accepts without editing all writing by people who are or have been incarcerated and those who work in and around prisons. The oft, often handwritten pages are uploaded directly as images and they are transcribed by volunteers. Uh, the entire collection is searchable in multiple ways, hence the transcriptions, open to researchers and the public. We can look here to see how many submissions are from Ohio and the kinds of things men and women have written. There are about 3,300 submissions right now in the archive. And I just learned last night, and I wish my husband who doesn't communicate well uh, had told me this earlier because he knew it, but the archive has been transferred to Johns Hopkins University with support of a two two million dollar grant from Carnegie Mellon to, uh, with the aspiration of 10,000 submissions by the end of the grant. So it's gonna be this huge searchable, only one of its kind in the whole world, archive of prison writing. Again, I don't think that because words from inside prison are read, unmediated and unrehearsed, that attitudes towards punishment will magically change. I don't think Dr. Larson thinks that either. If civic death is the sentence and objection that desired outcome, one cannot just be brought back to life in full voice and heard in a transparent or clear way by those on the outside of the walls. We on the outside have to look at the archive. We have to read it. We have to talk about it. We have to go inside the prisons. We have to talk about people and what they're thinking and why they write the way they do, etc. The incarcerated individuals I know are very well aware of this conundrum. They may or may not think they deserve to be in prison or the prisons are an appropriate kind of punishment, but they do know quite well they are constituted as other, as lacking credibility and viewed as inherently dangerous because they've broken the law of some sort. But also, it's often just the fact of being in prison that makes someone dangerous. Just the fact of being there makes us think someone is dangerous. And students often say in my classes, well, they must have done something wrong. And simply they did, right? Dangerousness is a different thing. Committing a crime and being dangerous are two different things, but we don't necessarily understand them. All of this is why citizens on the outside and on the inside of prison walls must be alert to how and whether individuals who are incarcerated. What's the other website? Which one? Oh, yeah, put that one up. That's good. The pen org? Yeah. This is an awesome resource. The uh, pen prison writing uh, uh, has been. Uh, in, in, in active, it has been active, not inactive, for 25 plus 8, wait, 25, 2008 plus 25 plus thir 14 is 39 years, uh, cultivating writings from within the prison and 
publishing and distributing them on the outside. So the Penn Prison Writers Project is a very different kind of project from the Prison Archive because it's more across the board literary and it's really polished writing and it's something that really, they have an a, a, a annual uh, contest that people who are incarcerated can um, participate in. So that's another uh, source that you could go to to find this. I wanted to also just continue that conversation about what men on the inside, in this case men, because I've worked only in the male prison in this context, they know that their voices, their speech, their patterns, their communicative habits have been what some call prisonized. In fact, we were talking yesterday about whether or not there is a genre of prison writing. Now, unfortunately, I'm not an English professor, so I don't know enough about a genre, but I was able to say a couple of things along with my collaborators that were really interesting about what that meant. And then we got on to the discussion of whether there's a genre of prison art. Would you recognize art that's produced from prison if you were in a gallery and, and see it? It was just a really great conversation about what is the impact of being in prison on your artistic and creative and analytical uh, voice. Right? All of that is why citizens on the outside and on the inside prison walls must be alert to how and whether individuals who are incarcerated are heard, the subjects invested with the rights to speak and write when that speak and write, that speech and writing is not about threats to others' actual safety and security. It's not just a question of being more humane or understanding or tolerant. It's actually a matter of understanding how power operates and how justice might be aspired to. Justice is a risky business, and we have to learn to listen to those who have violated the law and who we claim the authority to punish to those we think should have the very least say in how we organize our political world and as part of that project, how we organize our systems of punishment. Great.